Welcome to Celtic State of Minds. Your host today is Colin Watt, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a two-time Commonwealth Game athlete and former Olympian, Chris Bennett. Oh, hi, 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 hi. I'm not a former Olympian. I'm, I'm still an Olympian. <laughs> That's not right me after just yet, right? That's not me after just yet. <laughs> Chris, welcome. <laughs> Chris, welcome to the pod. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? Ah. Uh, Bit scared if he had a go at me there, but I'm doing all right. <laughs> oh, listen, I'm all right. I, listen, I must, I must apologise to the to the People's Democratic Republic of Carantine. I've just, uh, I've just been out of run this morning, so if you heard any minor tremors on the Richter scale, it was just, uh, it was just a twenty-three stone man running about Carantine. So fear not, we're all good. And I'm sure that'll come up in the Met Office report this evening. Um... <laughs> Michael, Michael Fish will have it on the, on the BBC. <laughs> How have you been uh, keeping anyway? I, t- I take it you've just been I, I, trying to get back into I, some sort of routine with the training. I good, good. So um, I um, I started working full time about fourteen weeks ago. So at the start of start of April, I was uh, I had to go work full time. So I started uh, delivering messages for Tesco. Other supermarkets are available. I must point that out. Um, so yeah, it's been a bit strange, but I went part time last week to get back into training. Um, I'm mm-hmm. still doing a bit of training during during lockdown. So. Um, it's been a bit of a strange one because I always kind of thought that the Olympics were going to get cancelled anyway and postponed. So I kind of hedged my bets on that. Um, wasn't making any money because I wasn't in schools or other sessions. So yeah, I took the decision to go full time uh, work for 14 weeks. It was a bit of a shock to the system. But trying to trying to train as well just wasn't happening. So I was training maybe two, three times a week. So I made the decision last week to go part time. Um, and now I'm back training five days a week and, and I'm on uh, what I call fat camp, which is trying to get the Trying to get the weight off, so um, aye, it's, it's it's nice and it's it's good. It almost gives me a wee bit of hard work before the kind of proper training starts in September. So yeah, it's aye, I'm, I'm keeping quite well. How's yourself? Yeah, I mean we're now a hundred days into lockdown, so it's it's certainly oh, it's iconic, it's, isn't it? it feels as if it's going on forever. I'm I'm wanting to get a I survived the 2020 lockdown T-shirt when we're finished. <laughs> um, put, oh. put, a, put a bit of Adidas on it, and it'll be a top seller in the superstore. Oh, um, that's a, 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 a story, a and get it waterproof as well. <laughs> <laughs> but for those that aren't aware of who you are, Chris, you just said you're a 23 stone man running about the GB Olympics team. Uh, the, the athletes. Aren't that bad that we've now got you running the hundred meters? You're a hammer thrower. Um, <laughs> I'm a hammer, yeah. So I'm a hammer thrower. Um, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not more far running the marathon, um, and I never will be. Um, so I'm, I'm quite heavy at the minute. I've put on a bit of weight over lockdown, and, and haven't we all? As much so. so I think we all have as well. I think it's uh, we should have a, a pre lockdown way in, and then a post lockdown way, in, and then like some sort of competition. Uh, but no, um, yeah, so I, I've been to Rio Olympics, um, two Commonwealth Games, I did Glasgow and I did um, Gold Coast. Um, I'm 30 years old now, so I've been doing the sport for 17 years and it's it's my main my main thing in life. It's I'm a full-time athlete. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that's a little bit about me, but I've kind of had a journey kind of over that, that period to get there. Um, yep. I've had some ups and downs, and but I think we'll touch on that more in the podcast. But yeah, that's that's a little bit about me. I came to a council house in Drum Chapel and Living in the East End now, and I'm just an, I like to see myself as an ordinary guy. I'm nothing special, and um, I'm just fortunate that I found a, a niche that I'm good at. And um, yeah, I've kind of followed it and been very lucky with that. Yeah, and as you said, we will touch on your career shortly. But first of all, when we have our guests on, um, we always want to find out what their Celtic state of mind is. So for you, where does your Celtic story begin? So I started, I've always supported Celtic. Um, I was going to say I started supporting Celtic. I've kind of always known Celtic as the club that my family followed. So my mum was a kind of big driving influence um, behind me uh, in football. Usually it's it's people's um, dads that, that take them to football, but my dad had no interest in football whatsoever. Um, my mum took her brother when she was younger to the football and used to lift him over the turnstiles and things like that. And, you know, she was in the old, the old jungle way back in the day. So... Um, when I got to the age of kind of five or six, I was getting more and more involved in sport, and my mum was taking a lot of football. And so, kind of my first Celtic game was back in 1995 um, in the cup semi final at Ibrox, which we lost, which wasn't which wasn't a fun experience. And then, um, yeah, so she's always been the, the, the kind of driving force behind me in sport, and not not just football, but everything and kind of in my life. So, um, yeah, so all up to my to my mum over that, and we. Um, I had a season ticket when I was younger in what now is the standard section. It was it was the old section back then. Um so we had that for three years and I got like I think I was more interested in, in, in stuff outside of football than the actual football. I never used to, used to actually watch the football, I used to just be interested in the, 
and the hot dogs at half time and, and things like that. So it was like, well, we used to, like, it was always like on a budget. Like I remember the season ticket, tickets where they the old pull off uh, mm-hmm. tokens and you yep. gave that to the guy in the turnstile. So uh, that's kind of, I used to always remember the season book covers as well. They were always, they were always cool when you got your season book cover through the year. It was always a different design on the front. Yep. Um, so I, I always used to look forward to the hot, the hot dogs being 23 stolen. It was uh, there was many hot dogs consumed all of my, <laughs> my time there. So uh, yes, it, it was it was fun growing up. Um, and then but we had to like, eventually take our season tickets up just because I was kind of getting better at sport and I got to the age of like 12, 13, and I started playing rugby and started um, kind of going to high school. We didn't have as much money as we had before. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. So my mum um, had to work three jobs to keep me in sport. Um, she got loans and things like that. My dad was disabled, so he had he had petty mal epilepsy um, all these days. So he was on incapacity benefits. So we didn't have much money when I was younger, um, and I always appreciated everything I got. I, and I was never I came from a family where I was never left wanting for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but we always had to work hard to get it. So my mum didn't want me to miss out. Um, so it, it was quite hard having a season ticket, and, and we gave it up because she decided, look, you're not going here for the football. You're going for, for the hot dogs. It's cost me more money. Taking the old Capri Suns in it, <laughs> and for half time as well. So, and and we gave it up, and and then kind of, you know, I'd always, um, I'd watch the games on the TV. I'd got the odd game here and there, and then I'd, I took the decision back in 20, 2016 before I went to the Olympics. I thought because I'd been told the whole year I wasn't going to the Olympics. I thought, you know what, I'm going to have something to cheer me up here. And it was coming to the end of Ronnie Dyla's kind of tenure, and I thought we were actually going to get David Moyes in, and I thought, you know what, David Moyes, I think that'd be quite good, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and I decided I was going to get a season ticket. I'd come into a bit of money. I had a bit of spare cash. I thought, you know what? I'm going to buy a season ticket this year. And I'm going to go and I'm going to have a distraction. And it's the best thing I've ever done, just purely for my mental health and some something to give me something outside of sport. Because I get very wrapped up in the sport that I do. If I commit to something, I'm doing it fully fledged and I'm committing everything I've got to it. So I was getting wrapped up in sport and not really not really having anything outside of that. So I went to the football. I bought, my, I bought a ticket for myself. I didn't know anyone sitting around me. It's one of the best things I've ever done. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been four years now, and we're going into fifth year, and I'm I'll love every minute of it. I've seen things that probably people will never ever see. You know, I never ever thought I'd see my team win another treble, never mind <coughs> three on the bounce. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's a big part of my life. As you say, it's an escape for a lot of people, and I think during this lockdown period, it's a escape that a lot of people are missing. Um, oh, exactly. Like, like the sooner we get to back to Celtic Park the better um, in my eyes because I see that I see those, those things coming out in the papers that it's like they might have 30,000 back in, in August and you know what the quicker we get back into Celtic Park the better um, but mm. the, the way I look at it is see if I can see a little bit of that season next year um, and it, even if it is just the last game of the season I think I put, I put a tweet out a couple of weeks ago saying if I pay my £600 for my season ticket and the only game I get to see is us lifting the 10 it'll be worth every penny of it and mm. anybody who says they don't think like that. To me, I can't understand that well. If you, I'm giving my 600 quid to Celtic. If that ensures us winning the 10 in a row, that's enough for me. Do you know what I mean? If I see, get to see one game and it's just Scott Brown, last day of the season, 10, party, brilliant. That was it. That, that, that's, that, that'd be worth it in my eyes. And I don't want any, gra- like, I don't want any congratulations for that. I don't want any, any kind of like, oh, you've been a special wee plaque or anything like that. I just, I'll, I'll know deep down that we we as Celtic fans were part of that, you know, because it's not just the players on the pitch, it's the fans, it's the people that work in the Super Bowl that all make it possible. Yeah, and you better hope that you're not called up for to head over to Japan before that trophy's lifted above Scott Brown's head. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, do you know what? It's quite funny. I've not actually seen us lift a league title in the four years I've had a season ticket because I'm usually away in Germany that weekend. So I'm kind of hoping... That I'm kind of hoping that it's not on that weekend, <laughs> and uh, I can <laughs> I can see it because I'll be pulling a sicky for that competition. I'll say that one. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks, thankfully, the Olympics are in uh, in July, so I'm, I'll, I'll should still be in the country. Um, so yeah, um, if the only one I get to see is I was lifting the ten, then uh, I, I would give up all the comp- the cup competitions in the league and and Champions League and Europa League. You know what? I'd give all that up just to see ten in a row because it's iconic. It's never been done before. It's what we've dreamed of as Celtic fans for the past nine years. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember I remember going to Celtic Park when they announced Brendan Rodgers and we were singing, singing here, we, what was it, here we go, five in a row. Five mm-hmm. in a row, we're now at nine. Do you know what I mean? It's mental to think. Four years on, we're now on the cusp of something that has never been achieved in Scottish football and probably never ever will, will ever be achieved again. So for me, I'd give up everything this season for the league. 
Yeah, That's no, what I'm Definitely, and it is, as you say, it's been a decade of dominance for Celtic. We've we've looked at that on the podcast and we've looked at the sort of best team over that decade and there's been some fantastic players. But if you take it back to when you were first going to the games in 95, who was the kind mm-hmm. of guys that you were idolising at that point? Who was coming through? So so my my first kind of idols were, were, were obviously the front three of Celtic at that time. It was Decanio, Cadetti and uh, Van Hoydonk. You know, Van Hoydonk was my hero growing up. And then... Uh, it, it, when he left to go to Nottingham Forest, it broke my heart. It absolutely broke my heart. He was my kind of first hero. And then uh, we kind of had that season where we had Cadetti up front and then he came in and you've got Wim Janssen coming in in 97. Right? 97, I think. Mm-hmm. 97 out of 98. And I remember, I hadn't been to a game in ages, but my mum had queued up for tickets for the last game of the season for, um, for the St. Johnson game. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, I just remember that, that whole experience of, I hadn't really appreciated what we'd done and stopping the 10 and how important that was do you know what I mean I remember seeing I now see it when it gets flashed back on, on Instagram like the Loudon Tavern were having their 10 in a row party and everything yep. like that and everything was it was nailed on for them to get 10 in a row so for us to stop that I mean I was looking at I was looking the other day and I've got photos of me on the pitch in 98 when we when we stopped the 10 and, and things like that are just oh it's, it, I didn't appreciate it at the time and I think when we get to that now and we hopefully do win 10 in a row I think I'll probably savour it for the rest of my life you know it'll be up there with It'll probably be Celtic's second most iconic moment after Lisbon, I think. Yeah. Arguably. Arguably. Yeah. Um, but no, gr- growing up, it was like the Cario and Cadetti and, and Van Hoydonk. And, and I remember we, like watching back now, we played really good football under Tommy Burns back then. We played brilliant football. Um, and I, th- I think if we were playing that sort of football now, it would be absolutely heralded, the amount of stuff that he was trying to do. Mm-hmm. You know, with people like um, the Maestro McStay, and, and as I've got older, I'm watching old clips of him. You know, he was at my well. Certainly, when I was that age, I was five or six. So I couldn't really appreciate it. He was an absolute genius, absolute genius with the ball. Um, and I remember having a debate the other day with somebody who works for the BBC and saying um, Paul McStay wasn't as rated as he should have been. Somebody told me that John Collins was a better midfielder than Paul McStay or Stan Petrov, and I'm just like, ah, get a grip yourself, son. <laughs> get, get a grip yourself. This is a maestro here, so. I think I've now got a more appreciate, appreciation of looking back at that that sort of time. Um, so no, it was probably the front three, like I said, the Cano and Cadetti and Van Hoyden. So it was the three amigos, the hot dogs and the Capri Suns that kept you going back then. Oh, <laughs> I don't, do you know what, ironically, I've got a really funny story. Actually, I remember uh, my mum used to work in the primary school that we that we um, that I went to, and she remember her telling me, tell us she got a. We get season tickets. And I remember, and it was St. Dunyan's up in uh, Blabardi, and I remember doing a, a knee slide <laughs> all the way along the, the corridor that we got a season ticket and banged into the doors. And I dripped both both knees and my, and my, my trousers, and my mum ended up slapping me for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it wasn't just the cost there, the, the money cost, it was also the, the, hurt, the hurt of getting slapped off my mum. So she was, she's a formidable woman, Mrs. Bennett. She's a formidable woman. <laughs> and I'm sure she's listening and she remembers that very fondly. <laughs> oh, she does, she does. Oh, I. So just going back, you, you mentioned Deller about the tweet that you'd said. Um, about spending the £600 and to be honest that was the first I'd really seen um, you on Twitter and it really sparked a bit of a debate and I think that debate is still ongoing because we don't really know what level we're at for season ticket renewals at the moment Um, we do know we do know that the season ticket waiting list is sold out so there's 10000 on that but you've actually got a bit of a funny story about being confused for someone else um, <laughs> that actually came on from oh. this tweet, and that is really oh. where I first. That's where I first picked up on you. So, do you want to tell the listeners what that's about? Uh, so, so uh, obviously, my name's Chris Bennett, right? and there's a there's, there was a chap on uh, Twitter who was doing an auction for the Kano Foundation, and it was I think it was a it was a Lee Griffiths signed top, and there was some sort of Scott Brown signed shorts or whatever. And he was doing a football card for it and uh, obviously take the names. I think it was a ten of a name. So all the profits were meant to go to the Kano Foundation. So anyway, this was, I think it was about three, four months ago. And uh, the chap that did it was for Newcastle. I won't, t- I won't say his name because I won't embarrass him, but he's a, he's a professional darts player for Newcastle. They support Celtic. So I'll let you do your research. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't get sued if I'm, if I'm putting his name. <laughs> he'd, uh, he'd put us up. And basically, he, he's, his old man had won the league with his shorts. And I think his dog had won the, the, shot, the, the shot or something like that. It was like, it was like the most closed competition ever, right? Uh, and, uh, and he ran away with all the money, didn't he? So he never donated any money to the Kano Foundation. So anyway, a couple of months passed, and 
had put this this tweet out about if I'd pay my six hundred pound, um, <laughs> then I'm the only game I get to see is the ten, and that happened for me. And somebody replied to it saying, "Are you still selling fake football cards, Chris?" And I'm like, "What's he on about here?" So I said, "I sent it to my mate Oi, did. How is he talking about here?" And he said, "He's he's staying here for that other guy." That other guy, Chris. So I'm like, "Do you know what? I'm gonna have a right laugh at this." So uh, so I, t- I tweeted him back saying, uh, "Unless I've suddenly moved to Newcastle, dyed my hair ginger, got laser eye surgery, then..." Yes, I have. How many numbers can I put you down for? <laughs> so I think he was absolutely mortified. So, but then I decided to get through, get through his, uh, get through his Twitter, and, and I found a picture of his bike. So I was going to bonus ball his bike and then take all the money for it. But no, I never done that then. But he was getting all these DMs about bonus balls for his bike and things like that. But I got a, a lovely apology the next day. And the way I see it is, it's, there's a lot of faceless wonders on Twitter, but I just take it as a laugh and a joke. I take, I take nothing serious here. I'm always a bit more mindful about what I say. Uh, about individuals and, and especially players and, and things like that because over the years I've had a lot of like tweets sent to me a lot, a lot of creepy, creepy stuff and a lot of uh, stuff like I mean remember when I was in Rio Olympics I got compared to um, Tom Watson who was the, the Labour deputy leader at the time in 2016 mm-hmm. and it was a polit- it was a political like what would you call him journalist that was doing it doing his doing his place and he, and he likened me to Tom Watson and he said I wonder if he has the same diet of having two pizzas for breakfast and being overweight and like, this was when I was out in the Olympics this was, this was the Daily Telegraph I think it was in mm-hmm. I'm just like I'm not ready for this sort of stuff and you know and, like I'm always a bit mindful about what I say on social media and because like, <laughs> some people will take it how it's meant to be and some people will take it completely out of context and I think just the world that we live in at the minute it's um, it, sometimes it's, it's it's not nice to say a lot of things and you've got to think about people's feelings on social media so it, it, I'm always mindful of what I say but I, I'm always up for a laugh I'm always up for a laugh and up for a wind up as long as it's not to anybody's anybody's harm or anybody's getting upset about it do you know what I mean it's, it's all good humour for me yeah and to be honest hearing the story of having two pizzas for breakfast that sounds fantastic you got it completely wrong it was three but um, <laughs> <laughs> and there, are, there, are, there are times that, like being an Olympian and, and, and going to Commerce Games there are times that we do let our hair down after we've been to a, a, a tournament and, and, and always some of the memories I've got are the week long benders after competitions are brilliant because well, I remember I was in Australia and I was uh, I, I was competing on the Sunday and I, I'd done terrible I'd finished 10th and um, had they done great but I ended up going out for the whole week after it and I was getting in at like 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning and the guys oh, this would be just getting in and having my what I would call dinner as such because the food hall at the, the Comedy Games and the Olympics is, is 24 hours a day you can get whatever mm-hmm. you want you can have pizzas you can have your Italian you can have burgers I think so I was getting at 8, 8 and 9 in the morning having two pizzas for my dinner then going to bed and waking up <laughs> so I was on uh, I was on UK time before I'd even left Australia it was <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, I know, it was a, that was a good experience. So we're going to touch on your career just in a minute, but I'm going to I'm going to give you two questions. Just one one we'll go for now, and one I'll leave you to ponder throughout the rest of the podcast. Cool. So the first one, having looked back over this period since you've had a season ticket, since you got it back, what your highlight has been from that period? So since basically when Brendan Rodgers took over to right now, what your highlight is then? That's the one I'll ask you just now, yep. and the one I'll leave you to think about is your highlight for last season, just last season. So, okay. the nine in a row season. So, if we go back to it, over the time that you've been back at Celtic Park, what has been your highlight? I've got, can I do two? Can I do a, a one at Celtic Park and a one away for Celtic Park? You can do whatever you want. Because there, there, there's, a, cause there's a funny story involved in the second one. So, probably, in fact, my one at Celtic Park is going to at Celtic Park, to be fair, when I think about it. So, for me, it would be a Scottish Cup final last year. Having that pressure of a treble, treble, Lennon coming in, and it was a, there was a lot of questions around Neil. I mean, I, I myself, personally, was happy with Neil up until the end of the season, but I didn't see him as a long-term replacement for Brendan Rodgers because if you look at it, it was a bit, at first it was a bit underwhelming and, and, I, and listen, I've been proved wrong massively this year that you go from Brendan Rodgers who's came from Liverpool and he's almost he's almost won the Premier League with Liverpool mm-hmm. apart from a, a Stevie Gerrard slip. Sorry, I had to get that in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you look at it and he's came from that and he's came and he's brought, he's revolutionised the club. He was a, I now like him, Brendan Rodgers, as a car salesman. He'll tell you what he wants to hear. He tells you everything you want. But then when you go from that and you go from qualifying for the Champions League to coming, like we've got Neil Lennon, who's just been sacked by Hibs. Right? Mm-hmm. So for me, I was a bit underwhelmed. But obviously the pressure of completing a treble, uh, and no matter what you say, he still had to win the cup. So 
everyone can say Rogers started it, but, but Neil Lennon finished it. He went to Easter Road, got a result which Rogers hadn't done. He won in the semi final and then beat Hearts in the final. So for me, it was that moment because it was almost like it was slipping away when Ryan Edwards scores for scores for Hearts up the Hearts end at Hamden. I remember going, "Oh no, oh, mm. crap!" It's because like I had the, I didn't have a good record at, at cup finals before that. Mm-hmm. I had to beat a cup because oh, because I'm away with my sport. The last time I was at Hamden was when we got beat off Rangers. To each and mm-hmm. all each guy's a penalty, so I'm thinking I've not got a good record. What am I going to do? So um, I remember there's an old boy sitting next to me, and we'd obviously just lost Billy McNeil, and we'd lost uh, Stevie Chalmers, so it was quite an emotional day as well. And we had the whole big T4 and the yeah. little camera with, with the, the green, white, and gold. So it was it was an emotional day, and then for Eddie to pop up and score two goals, I remember I was in fits of tears. The old boy next to me was in fits of tears. I've never seen him since that day. And uh, we're both these in fits of tears, hugging each other. And I was like, oh, you know what? It was just an amazing, an amazing day to finally see history being made. Like nine trophies in a row. And what, seeing a treble treble, I'll probably never, we'll never ever see that again in my lifetime. No. Um, so, so for me, that was that was probably my, my most special moment in Scotland at Celtic Park. But then the other, the other kind of one was... Um, I'm going to go back to Anderlet and 3 0 away from home mm-hmm. because there's, there's a kind of story behind it. So, I work for a company called Nirvana who do the Celtic fan travel. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I worked for them before I did the Celtic stuff. Um, they do a lot of stuff with Great Northern and Great Scottish Run. And that's how kind of, I, I made a bit of my money. I used to work those and we used to look after the elite side of things. So, I still do. Um, so, we'd look after like your Mofaras and people like that. Highly Gabby Salas as come in. So, we'd organise the race. So, Nirvana was a travel partner. And, um, I knew them really well, and I remember sitting. They were sitting in the, UK, um, the Hilton at Newcastle, and they said to me, "You get the contract with Celtic." And I'm like, "I am." What are you talking about? We get the contract with Celtic. I said, "So we're doing the fa- we're doing the, the fan travel this year." I says, "How do I get to go on it?" I says, I'll pay, I says, "I'll pay my money." I says, "I'll pay my three hundred quid, whatever it is to go." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no! Come work it for us. Come work it for us." And I'm like, ah, "Nah, nah, that'll not happen." I says, "I says, not a chance." I says, "You'll not, you'll not let me come work it." So. Bear in mind, I've never done one of these away trips before. Never been abroad to watch Celtic ever in my life. So I'm just mm-hmm. like, I need one. They phoned me 10 days later. It's just, it's, it's just, it was two weeks before Anderlecht, and then they phoned me 10 days later. And they says, what, you still want to go to Anderlecht? I says, aye. Right, cool, Beck, that was great. But for four o'clock on uh, Tuesday morning, and uh, you're in charge of the flight. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't have a scooby what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't have an absolute scooby what I'm doing. So they put me in charge of 187 people on a flight, distribute tickets, everything. Turn it off. I don't know if I could be what I'm doing here. I hadn't slept the whole night before. I wasn't going to go because I was I was that petrified about what I was trying to organise and everything. So get to Brussels. I think two people lost their passport, but most three people on the trip. And I'm like, oh no, what am I going to do here? Celtic end up winning three 0 I'm like, <laughs> absolute dancer, right? So I'm meant to be working. I'm on the t- I'm on the TV, getting it, getting it loud. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I'm meant to be working here. So he gets back on the flight, and uh, these two women have lost their passports. She's like, you need to get me into Glasgow. And I said, like, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> I was like, you've lost your passport. I'm not here to babysit you. So we got them back to Glasgow eventually. And honestly, it was just it was a complete whirlwind trip. I remember booking a hotel for that day just to go back to back to bed for two hours because I was that stressed. <laughs> <laughs> I paid 140 euros for a two-hour nap in the middle of Brussels. And it was the best two-hour nap I've ever had in my life. Most expensive at all. But honestly, un- unbelievable. And uh, yeah, so that's been uh, that's been three years now I've been doing that. So I get to, I get to follow kind of Celtic abroad as, as work as such. So it's, it's been great. So I went, to, I went to PSG on the team flight, which was really, really special. I missed them very scolding because I was outside organising things. So I did St. Petersburg, done Valencia. Um, done all the big ones and then we did Rome this year and, and mm-hmm. again missed, missed the winning goal outside in, <laughs> in Rome because I was I was out organising buses but I remember after the first goal went in I got I get three pints chucked all over me and uh, it, was, <laughs> oh, it was absolute scenes people ended up 10 rows in front of where they were meant to be so oh, no, it, it's, it's been a great kind of last four years to be a Celtic fan you can say it's been a great nine years to be a Celtic fan but especially the last four years I think people of kind of that were born late 90s early 2000s I've had it really 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 good being a mm-hmm. Celtic fan if you look at it the amount of trophies we've won over the past 20, 23 years you look at it but um, I think people of the older generation will appreciate this success a wee bit more um, going through obviously Rangers nine in a row period and, and when the club was was on its knees, so it's it's nice to be it's nice to be winning things and winning them in style. As you said, some of the trips you've been on, like the Rome trip, I was in I was over in Rome and that was a fantastic day. I'd say it's probably oh. one of the best experiences I've had following Celtic, especially when it's the first time I've actually seen Celtic score a goal away from home in Europe. I was a bit oh, is it? oh. So it was quite funny when I went to Anderlecht, my uncle goes on away on other trips and he'd uh, he didn't go to Anderlecht, he couldn't get it off. He says, Yeah, absolutely. 
bastard. I can't <laughs> really talk about it. He says, uh, I've been following Celtic for 10 years. Right? I missed Moscow. I never got to see them winning Smart Tech Moscow. You go on your first trip, they win three in a hand. So, oh, it was brilliant. And, and like Rome, I think just Rome as a city was a, was amazing as well. Stunning. I think it almost made it, oh, it, it, probably the best city I've been to. And I've been to a lot of cities in Europe. Just actually wandering in Rome for the day was was amazing. Got the Colosseum, got the Vatican, the uh, Trevi Fountain, Spanish Steps, all those things. And such an iconic city. And then going there, Going to the Stadio Olimpico and, and, and winning, and then you get 8,000 Celtic fans behind the goal for nearly 10 minutes singing Papa Francesco. It's just it's, it's like, it's the stuff dreams are made of, do you know? Mm-hmm. No, definitely. I'll never forget that trip for as long as I live, and I can only thank <laughs> Olivier and Cham for scoring that last minute winner because it felt as if it took about three hours for the ball to hit the back of the net. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'll, I'll never ever appreciate it. I'll never ever get to see it in live, but do you know the thing I love watching back is Sutton's commentary of it. Because yeah. it's the most biased commentary you'll ever get in your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, he's let the BT, ma- the BT sport mask just slip and the Celtic mask is coming out there. Oh, it's brilliant. And, and do you know what to top it all off? I, I, I got back into the stadium after, after it was all, after the final whistle. I could see Neil Lennon coming back out, bless his cell. I thought, yep. oh, if Carl's fucked in with European away trips. That was, it was fantastic. So I'll leave you with your highlight. I think you might have already spoiled it, what your highlight of this season might have been. No, 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 um, no, 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 no. I've no spoiled it. I've no spoiled it. Don't, don't get away. But we're going to move in and take a look at your career. And as I said, you are a hammer thrower. Now, when I was doing PE in school, it was football, rugby, badminton, basketball, but never a hammer throw. So how did how did that come about? So, for people that don't know what it is, if you and probably most people have seen Matilda. So, I am basically the male version of Mr. Unspool from <laughs> Matilda. And, <laughs> yeah, so, it, it is, it's a 16-pound um, ball, which is 7.26 kilos in old money, or new money, sorry. And it's 121 centimetres long, and we spin round four times at a cage and let it go. So, it originated back in the, the Scottish Highlands, where farmers used to use it as a test of strength. So what you see in the Highland Games, which is a wooden shaft or with a ball at the end of it, it used to be a sledgehammer. They do. Now, um, in some parts of Glasgow, they still do throw sledgehammers, <laughs> uh, but in other parts, they don't. Um, <laughs> so but that's how it originated back in those days. So what we see now in the Highland Games is, is the most traditional form of it. We've just taken it and um, almost enhanced it and, put, and taken it into the, the Olympics. So, yeah, I started off when I was when I was 13, 13 years old. I, um, I used to play rugby quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually played f- football before that, but I was always like the little, the little fat kid in school. I was, I was wider than I was taller. Wasn't really that athletic as such, um, but was always keen for sports. And, and my mum was always, was always really, really pushy. That's, that's the one thing that's been really kind of prevalent through my life is my mum has always pushed me to do things and, mm-hmm. and got me out of the house. And, and I can obviously owe a lot to what, to what she's done. And she's a, an absolute gem, gem of a woman. I think a lot of people will, will say that about their own mum, but like my mum's kind of quite tough, and she, she, she's come out the other side of it. So like I didn't have it all when I was growing up, you know, like mm-hmm. I said, my mum had to take three jobs to keep me in sport and, and we didn't have um we didn't have a car. We had to use public transport to go everywhere and my dad had paid my leg actually so I've kinda of always had a, a tough when I was growing growing up and I but I never ever seen that as a an obstacle. Mm-hmm. That was just life for me. So um, I don't I don't I can have this motto in life where there's always a way to do something. And I, I don't I don't like these people who just give up and just say, oh, do you know what that's like, oh, I can't do this because I've not got a car or you know, I've not got the money to do that. There's always a will, a will, a will or a way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we always found that. So, yeah, I started playing football, um, was packed in goals because I, I couldn't kick a ball um, to save myself, but I could throw myself in front of people because I was, <laughs> I was quite big. And generally, being a bit bigger, I filled more of the goals than the other people, so it was easy to <laughs> harder for people to score. So it was quite, it was quite, it was quite um, a shock to the system doing that. Um, and then, but then I obviously started playing rugby because of my size. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm six foot, but I'm quite, got a low centre of gravity and my, my legs are quite big, so people quite found it quite hard to tackle me playing rugby. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I got into that, but I never really fitted into the social demographic of rugby. Um, it's a very private, private school sport when it comes to a lot of money and me coming to a, a council house in Glasgow and drum chapel didn't, didn't really sit well with people, so I never really fitted into that social demographic, like I say. So one of my friends did athletics and he said, um, do you fancy coming down and uh, trying? And I remember going down to Scotland Stadium on the first night and uh, hated it because we were running laps on the track and I was blown, 
blown out my backside, and, <laughs> and it was it was I hated it, I absolutely hated it. So uh, I went back to my mom and I said, I'm not going back. She says, No, you're. Yeah. <laughs> and that was that was the case of you're going back uh, because I don't win you in the house. So it, it was good for that sense, and it was around the sort of time when the Manchester Commonwealth Games were on. So Hammer was on the TV. I seen this guy doing it. He did a front flip when he won, and I was like, I want to do that. I couldn't I? I was like, I just want to try it. Just want to try it. And kind of started mm-hmm. that. At that age of 13, doing it, training two nights a week down at my local athletics club. Kind of won a lot of medals when I was younger because I was I was quite strong, I was good at my sport, so I didn't really have to work that hard for it until I got mm-hmm. to 18, 19. And then suddenly, when I started having to work for things, I found it tough and I kind of fell out of love with the sport. Went away just before my, my 20th birthday on a four-week bender, didn't really want to do anything and was kind of getting mixed up with the wrong people and decided I kind of had a, a long, hard look at myself. of like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it properly. So I just missed out on daily Commonwealth Games, which were um, in 2010, and, and I had a long, hard look. I was like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to get to Glasgow Commonwealth Games and I'm going to I'm going to give it a proper shot. So I qualified for, for Glasgow Commonwealth Games three years ahead of time. So it was, was way ahead of schedule. But then in the read up to that, I lost my dad and I lost my coach within nine months of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so I lost my dad, dad at the end of 2012 and I hadn't really been training as such before it because he would, I knew he was dying and um, kind of fell out of love with the sport and came back and uh, decided that you know I'm going to I'm going to get into it and this was kind of sort of around December time I was like right you know I'm going to make a crack at it again got to December had a good four months training behind me and then my coach died in April he had uh, he had liver cancer so I was just like oh and I never really processed it at all at the time I kind of struggled struggled through that season kind of almost like putting plasters on good things to keep myself mm-hmm. going and, and I decided that I was going to I was going to keep going but I eventually started getting coached by a guy in London so I had to commute between Glasgow and London so I used to have to get the um, the red eye flight on a Saturday morning down to London for training and then come back up later on that night so it was quite tough went to Glasgow had a, a really good year before leading up to Glasgow and then just the occasion get the better of me Com- got completely overwhelmed and I couldn't really process what was going on and mm-hmm. I thought oh, you know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to win a medal for my dad and I'm going to win a medal for my coach and it's a hand and it's going to be so good I could picture myself at the top of the podium and then I remember going into the final and I was dead last. I was like, that's a bit crap. So, and, and, and that was what it was like. I like yeah. It's like, is this it? Like, is this, is this what my sporting career is going to be? So I remember leaving the stadium in floods of tears and I was just like, you know what, I'm never going to, ever going to feel as bad as I did that day. Mm-hmm. And I thought, if I can get myself to Gold Coast, that'll be that'll be good. That'll be, and that's that's what I set myself. So eventually, I trained the next year in the World Champs in China and Beijing. And I'd done enough to get selected. The British Athletics had selected me, and I almost used that as a bit of motivation to say, "Do you know what? I've made I've made the target you've set. You've just decided not to take me. So I'm going to prove you wrong. And next year I'm going to go to European Champs. I'm going to make the final, and I'm going to go a big, you know, fuck you, to British Athletics. And that's mm-hmm. that's what I do because that's just my attitude. If someone tells me I can't do something, I go right, I can. It's, mm-hmm. it's that typical kind of West West of Scotland Glasgow attitude. I can't do something. You want to bet I can. And, right. and that's that's kind of that's kind of how almost my attitude works. And so, uh, 2016, I was flying that year. I got into came out and I threw a meter personal best. I was doing uh, my personal best 76.45. So I put two meters on my personal best from the previous year, which was oh. 74.66. So I was kind of I was kind of flying coming out the year, but it spent the whole year telling me I wasn't going to the Olympics. I hadn't met their selection criteria, so I wasn't going. So I was like, cool. Do you know what? I've made European champs. That's fine. I'll go. I'll go to Amsterdam, I'll, have, I'll, I'll enjoy competing and then I'll enjoy Amsterdam after it. So I got to, I'd won British champs 10 days before European champs. Mm-hmm. And I get to Amsterdam and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go just have, I'm going to go out and enjoy myself. And uh, it was fucking, it didn't rain. Nobody was up for it that day in the qualifying. I turned up and I finished fifth in qualifying and I'm like, ah, I finished that. Holy shit, he's made the final. So I made the final in Amsterdam. I was like, do you know what? I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve this sport. That's it. I'm, uh, I'm done this year. So I went to Amsterdam. I had a couple of days in Amsterdam left. I enjoyed the, the sights and, and the tourist attractions in Amsterdam. Shall we say there's some, some lovely, lovely tourist attractions in Amsterdam. I'm sure some nice museums. <laughs> oh, lovely museums. Anne Frank's house is, is, is right up there um, with everything. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, so it was good. It was good. And uh, I got back to, to Glasgow on the Tuesday and the selection meeting was on the Wednesday for the Olympics. So I remember sitting at, uh, I was training at Lundwood that night and I got a phone call with a guy called Peter Stanley for British Athletics. And he says, uh, so the phone rings and I says, oh, hi Peter, how you doing? I had a really good relationship with him, so we could have a laugh and a joke. Mm-hmm. So I says, I'll take it as a phone call to tell me I'm not going to Rio. He's like, oh, what do you mean? I was like, well, you've told me a whole year I'm not going. He's like, oh no, you better change your plans, you've got the Olympics. And I'm like, oh fuck. That's not how you should be reacting to going to the Olympics and I'm like, I've just spent the last year planning my life as if I'm not going to the Olympics and thinking, do you know what, I've got my mate's wedding, I've got his stag do, I've got this and I'm no training and that's it and I'm going, I've got to change all these plans and like literally in three weeks time I was going to Brazil and I was like, nah, surely not. 
So he says, look, you've got a phone call tomorrow to come out the press tomorrow, sorry, to confirm that you're going. And there's just been an article put out saying that I wasn't going to Olympics. So um, apparently someone at British Athletics had told this journalist that I wasn't going to the Olympics in Rio. And I just got the notification through my phone and I'm sitting there going, ha ha, <laughs> 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 It was so funny. So this was the Tuesday, uh, this was, aye, the, the Wednesday was when the article came out and I got told I was going to the Olympics. And the Thursday it was getting announced. And so the journalist is phoning me and phoning me like mad. And I'm just like, nope, I'm going to sit and let you sweat this one over. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was quite good. Yeah, so it was about a world one kind of three weeks. And literally on the Thursday, I was on a flight to Birmingham to go collect my kit. And, and it's not an easy process. It's a, an eight-hour kit and out process for mm-hmm. going to Olympics. The kit we got was 92 kilos worth of luggage for going all the way to Brazil. So it's a long, a long process. It's, and because they, um, they'd spent the whole year um, not having me on any like selection list or anything, I had to do all the paperwork and everything. So it was it was quite a stressful period, and then I, I left for the Olympics two weeks later. But I, t- I had to postpone going out because I just wasn't mentally ready for it because I hadn't prepared myself for that I was going to go. So it was it was quite a surreal experience. Uh, I flew out five days after the team had like kind of like Anderlecht had slept the night before, and I was I was stressed about it. Like, I'm, I'm a worrier. I've got I've got I suffer with really bad anxiety. Mm-hmm. So if, I, if I go into new situations, I don't like it. I, I don't like things I'm not comfortable with. I, I have a wee like, panic attack. I've learned to cope with it now, but I've not. I, I didn't at the time. So I'm, like, right, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm, like, I'm not going to Olympics. And then I'm sitting there going, "What do you mean you're not going to Olympics?" It's like I almost had to like a. It's like you get the, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder. What do you mean I'm not going to the Olympics? So I almost having that conversation myself. So I decided. I decided I was going to go to the Olympics. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those decisions. Like, I'm going to go. Do you know what I mean? Are you were forced, forced, forced to go. You forced yourself to go. Oh, I know. I get, so I got to the airport and I just I, I chanced my arm. I was in full kit. And I says, like, any chance of your upgrade? And he says, uh, yes, that was 750 quid. I says, no, thank you very much. I'll just go to the plane and, and get class. <laughs> so, so I get to, I get to London, the Heathrow, and we were flying out of Terminal 5, and I thought, right, I'll chance my arm again here. And I says, look, how much is it for an upgrade? So I changed my tone. How much is it for an upgrade? And the woman says, she says, 155 pounds. I says, you know what? I says, I'll just pay it so I can get asleep. So it was at the premium economy. I was like, ah, she's, she, so she says, I've, I've blocked off the seat next to you so you can get my extra room. I'm like, yeah, man, so here we go. No no drooling on MD on the right hand side when I fall asleep or anything like that. So it, it was good. And then I remember there was this guy kicking off about not having extra legroom in premium economy. And I'm just sitting there with my headphones on. He's kicking off. And the guy comes up, taps my shoulders. He's saying, Excuse me, sir, would you mind moving for this gentleman? I says, No. <laughs> no. I'm, I've got my seat. I'm going to say, He says, No, would you mind moving? I've got your nicer seat at the front of the plane. And I'm like, ah, Right, okay, straight out of business class. <laughs> <laughs> you absolute dancer. Having not slept like the whole night before, I, it was a 13 hour flight to, to Rio, and I think I, I woke up for my lunch and I woke up for my dinner, and most of the other time I just fell asleep during it. So it was it was great, and um, I got to Rio, and, and I remember getting to um, getting to Rio, and uh, it still hadn't sunk in that I was going to the Olympics. I still thought I was going to wake up and somebody was going to say, Look, you're not going. Mm-hmm. Um, and I landed in and we own the camp says, look, just like to welcome you to Rio de Janeiro, um, home of the, the 2016 Olympics, um, just like to welcome all our um, members of Team G on the Team GB on the flight. And I'm like, oh no. And I just started busting my green. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? But it was it was that moment I got there and it was real. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh no, like I'm actually here. Like no one can ever take me this, uh, this away from me. I'm a, I'm an Olympian and I'll always be known as an Olympian. I've got the tattoo to prove it, but the, some of the people keep thinking it's the Audi rings I've got in the back of my leg, which is a bit, <laughs> which, it's like, I've worked, I've worked 16 years of my life to get the Audi rings on the back of my leg, never mind the, never mind the Olympic rings, so some people need a wee bit educated with that, so, and, it was, and it was just an amazing experience um, to get there, and then I didn't really kind of do what I'd, what I'd wanted to do, um, I, I wanted to make the final there, but I was underprepared, was naive to think I could kind of wing it as such, um, mm-hmm. so got there, couldn't really do much, and decided that I was going to come back, and I struggled with the sport, because I'd achieved everything I ever wanted to sport, and more, so my goals had completely changed, and I was just like, I'm just doing that sport because I enjoy it. And I almost kind of got guilty of kind of ghosting through it for a couple of years, mm-hmm. um, getting comfortable, and struggled with a lot of injuries, struggled with my back and uh, my knee, but got myself in a good shape for, for Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. I thought, right, this is it. You know, I'm going to go there. I'm going to commit to it, and I'm going to um, I'm going to win a medal. I'm going. I'm going. I was in the shape of my life getting out there, mm-hmm. um, and and got to the day and just crumbled again, completely crumbled. And and that was the kind of the the, the moment in my in my life that I realised that I had a problem and and I got there and I remember I remember finishing at the Commonwealth Games I was just like this can't have happened again I was like this cannot have happened again surely I'm going to wake up tomorrow and it's just this is just a dress rehearsal tomorrow we're going to 
No, I was, I was out, and, and, and like I'd get, I'd be getting talked up for a medal. I was, I was flying, and I finished tenth, and I was just like, I cannot do this. I can't do it. And I remember, and I, I had a mental breakdown when I left the, the stadium, and I was just, I, I kind of kept myself out of these way for two days, and, and then got on with it as such. Uh, but it all kind of came to my head um, after I'd finished at, at, at Gold Coast, and I remember because I'd, um, I'd flown out separate from the team. I had to fly home separate for the teams. I couldn't fly home in their same flight because I was in business class because I, I just because the size of me, I decided to go extra to, mm-hmm. to pay extra to go business class to size me. So I remember sitting in the airport and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I was like, I literally don't want to be here. I don't want to be part of this anymore. And I don't want to do athletics. Do I even want to be part of this life anymore? Do I, was I going to do something stupid? And I, and I genuinely, I contemplated doing something really stupid. And um, I said, I was on the phone with my mum and I was on the phone with my uncle and I was just like, I need to go home tonight. I was like, and obviously that's not a, an easy thing to do when you're coming home for Australia, you're, 20, mm. you're 24 hours travel home to there. So I'm like, I need to go on a flight tonight. Because my flight was, was 24 hours after everybody else. I was like, I'm not staying in Brisbane myself for, for an hour, for a full day. So I ended up booking a, booking a flight home that night with China Airlines. Granted it was, and I had to fly business class because of the amount of luggage I had. It was actually cheaper to do that. And uh, it was the best thing I've ever done because I, I could get home around people that actually that actually knew me and uh, knew how I acted situations and the first thing I did when I came back was I went and seen a psychologist and just sat and, and opened up to her. Now I'd seen her before when, when my mum and my mum and my dad and my, my coach had died. So I'd oh. seen her and uh, it was the best it was the best thing I'd ever done. I will take your problems on but I won't dump my problems on you. Because mm-hmm. uh, to me it was a sign of weakness. But it's not. Uh, so, so she didn't have that present opinion of me. Uh, so I could go in and just be open and honest and up front. And it was great. Uh, so I've seen her after I come back to the Gold Coast kind of worked on what on my mental side of things and, and, and come back and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this sport because I enjoy it. And I was getting five, six injections in my knee uh, to kind of try and stop it for, for hurting. Um, and I went to the surgeon and the surgeon's like, look, I need to open you up to, to have a look at what's going on inside your knee. And I was like, yeah, cool. I was like, I'm, I'm cool with that. If you've got my best interests at heart, go with it. So I went back to British Athletics. I says, look, the surgeon wants to go in and do an arthroscopy, which is basically opens up your knee, but a keyhole surgery as a look. I said, the British champs for 10 days later, I says, you're going to have to let me miss British champs. I went, no. I says, what do you mean? He says, well, I've had the operation. I was back on my feet after five days. So you'll be fine. I was like, mate, they are going to open up my knee, have a poke inside, and you're expecting me to perform next week. Like, what are you talking about? So that was, I kind of struggled with that. And I decided that I wasn't going to get the, uh, wasn't going to get the operation. I just kept getting injections. And it kind of ghosted through the season again and got to, um, got to the end of the year. And I was like, Right, that's it. I'm taking nine weeks away for the sport, or ten weeks it was, sorry, to decide if I, this is what I want to do. Uh-huh. Um, and am I doing it because people are paying me to do it, or am I doing it because I enjoyed it? Now, I started off in sport because I enjoyed it, not because I was ever making a wage out of it. Uh-huh. So for me, it was about, was I enjoying it again? And, and I decided that I was going to do that, and I was going to move back home and, and have a lot more time at home and move my training back to, to Scotland and, and just enjoy it a lot more. And then, kind of, that's now 18 months now I've been back home and, and absolutely loving life. and. In, in, a, in a fit and healthy mental mental state as well. Yeah, and as you said, you've had an incredible career. Um, you've been to two Commonwealth Games and Olympic Games. If we just look at those in a bit more detail, especially starting with the 2014 Games, with them being in Glasgow, the opening ceremony being at Celtic Park, what was that like as a Celtic fan walking out in front of a full house? Unbelievable. So I'll tell you a wee story. There were was, there was certain people on the team, right, and they'll remain nameless, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know who they were, but they wouldn't go to Celtic Park because they were massive Rangers fans. And I'm like, ah, get a grip of yourself. Get a grip of yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's a home Commonwealth Games. See, if it was Ibrox, right, I would have no qualms about walking out on it, right? Because mm-hmm. it's Glasgow, it's Commonwealth Games, and I'm not I'm not like that. I'm not better like that. I'm there for the experience. I'm there to compete. But there was people on the team that wouldn't go, or they would have their Union Jack phone cover on the back of their phone, taking photos. I'm just like, get a grip of yourself. But anyway, it was amazing because the, the old com- or the Commonwealth Games are just still there. All the athletes live there, so there was there was ten thousand athletes living in there. And for the opening ceremony, all those athletes almost got walked round in a parade round round the round the pitch at Celtic Park. So we were we were kept to last. So I think we got ready about half past four, but we weren't due to walk on until nine o'clock. So we we walk on um, from basically the bottom of Dalmarnock where the old village is. Mm-hmm. And we had to walk all the way up. It's probably two of us to walk walk that mile up to it. And I remember they held everybody back for that time. To, to, and we got a full, a clear runner the whole round Celtic Park. I remember looking in and thinking, oh, that's quite a lot of people. But then I obviously didn't realise, uh, obviously I did realise, but at the time I was kind of like, oh, crap, there's another tier. So there was 45,000 people like round, round the stadium on their feet clapping for us. And it was the best two and a half minutes of my life. Um, no jokes for many of the two and a half minutes. But, um, <laughs> but, it, but it, was, it was unbelievable. And I remember just going off and it was that buzz. And I couldn't sleep that night because it was, it was that amazing. 
And um, then getting to getting to compete at Hamden and just in front of that, 45,000 people. It was amazing. And it was face experiences that I'll never ever let, um, leave me. Because I remember driving up to the bus to Hamden on the first day I was there and it was like, literally packed and it was as busy as it would be for like a cup final day. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, can I get my head in front of about this? Because I'm going to go out into the stadium and I'm going to be the one that's there trying to perform. And it was like, I sat in the stadium on the first night and I was kind of like, all right, okay, it's quite loud in here. And then I got into the middle and I was like, holy shit, it's even louder in here. So for me, that was it was a great experience and just seeing Glasgow kind of, my, my home city um, as a showcase put on probably for me, probably the greatest ever combat games that there, there will and there ever will be. There might be a wee bit biased in that. Mm-hmm. But just the whole experience of being in, in and around Glasgow that weekend, or no, that two weeks, sorry, was, was amazing. And something will never, ever leave me. But definitely. And I remember back to the Commonwealth Games. It was just a, it was an exciting period to be Scottish. There was a lot of yeah. optimism. They were looking forward to the, the independence referendum coming up as well. And it was just a, a great time to be a Scottish sports fan. Um, and to yeah, have that experience was, must be incredible. It was, it was amazing. And like I've got friends from Commonwealth Games that, that do you know what, I've made life, friend, um, lifetime friendships with them. So, and there's people that, that, that were working at those games that I still speak to. And like, like I say, memories that will never ever leave me. Like it came up in my, my uh, Facebook a couple of days ago, or a couple of days ago, sorry, that it was, it was six years to the day since I got selected. And my social media went absolutely mental. Um, and just people trying to get tickets off you, people wanting to come along and watch. and Mm-hmm. And it was just, it's, it's a surreal experience. You were almost thrust into the limelight from, from nowhere, and a lot of people were. And we've seen a lot of people flourish, and we've seen a lot of people not do so well. So you mm-hmm. people like Charlie Flynn. Everybody remembers the mailman for Charlie for, for Commonwealth Games, and he, and he was great because he was a character. And to me, that epitomised Glasgow because he was just a normal guy who was a postie who came and won a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. Um, and you see people like Josh, it was almost a catalyst for Josh Taylor. Mm-hmm. So people that know the box know Josh Taylor won gold in 2014 then we're on to go to the pro ranks and is now a, a unified world champion and he's now fighting a fight in the hydro so that's almost it's been always been the catalyst for his career and it did that for so many people as well but it also did it for glasgow as a city because glasgow's always been known as a sporting city mm-hmm. but if you look at the events that we've had since the commonwealth games have come in i think we've got the euros next year We've had multiple world championships here. We had the European Athletics Championships, indoor athletics championships with the European Championships in 2018. It's just been a complete buzz around the city and it's been a great catalyst for regeneration around the city as well. If you look mm-hmm. at the East End of Glasgow, it's done so much for people around there that I think more than sport has ever achieved. It's about the, the social factors it's given people as well. So it was a great, great time. And I think hopefully in my lifetime, I'd like to see Glasgow do that again because mm-hmm. I think... It would, it would be another springboard for more, more success for the city. And as you mentioned, the, the East End of Glasgow getting done up, and we have to thank Glasgow City Council for the Celtic way. Are we uh, doing deep? Are we doing deep? <laughs> it was, uh, it's absolutely incredible, the, the, the regeneration around that, that kind of area. And I remember, I remember when I first went, I started going to Celtic Park and Park Edge, the old school next to it, which all the players used to park in. Mm-hmm. I remember I used, to, I used to queue up for autographs because they all used to come up. And I remember, I always, big Mark Weeper, I always wanted Mark Weeper's car. And it was, looking back, it was an absolute terrible car for a footballer. It was a Volvo V70, but it was burgundy with cream leather interior. But I remember, I've got all the, I've got the, I've got the photos with like, with people like Reggie Blinker and Tosh McGinn. In fact, I'll tell you what I've got, actually. You, you, you'll know me able to see this. I remember when I was looking for, I was outside for autographs, right? And I've got Tosh McKinley's, you won't be able to see it because we're obviously not playing the video. Tosh yeah. McKinley's copy of the, five, the 5-1 game. Brilliant. So outside the stadium, I saw that's an old VHS that I found the other day, and it's Tosh McKinley's got because Tosh McKinley went to school with my uncle, and I said, "This is your uncle." He says, uh, "He's your uncle." I said, "Jim Kearney." He says, "Ah, oh. she's oh, I've, uh, I've my copy of the five one game, the five star boys, uh, five one at uh, Celtic Boot Rangers at, at Parkhead." So, um, aye, it's it's just I've got so many memories growing up of that, and, and people like Alan Stubbs and Bratback. I've got photos with Bobby Murdoch and people like that outside. Celtic Park, and that was my mum. We used to get the bus up to the East End. With Q I think it was St Clair's, um, was, the, was the primary school that was there. Mm-hmm. And you had the old tickets off his mind. We used to always queue up outside it, and, and people would come in, and uh, other players would come in, sorry, and get the autographs. And I need to dig them out because there's some absolute belters. People like Enrico Anone, De Canio, people like that are absolute legends of the game. Uh, like David Hanna and people like that, it's going really back, and Andy Tom. And I've got all these things. And so, like, Celtic's been part of my life for, like, 25, 26 years. Um, so just going back to then, to the Commonwealth Games and, and, and Glasgow regenerating, it's been nice to see it come full circle because that area was all tenements beforehand. 
Now it's you've obviously got the arena at the Serena, which is where I train, and you've got the new village, which is over on the left hand side, and, and the flats in there are amazing. And I remember I actually went back to the house that I lived in, and I camped on the door, and the guy got the flight his life. He's like, all right, I says, I, I, I've slept in your house, right? And the, <laughs> and the guy was like, what? I said, sorry, I should expand on that. I said, I've slept in your living room. <laughs> and he was like, oh. So his living room was now our bedroom, and it, it was on Scotland Street. So all the streets are named after um, cities and that have held the Commonwealth Games. So you've got like Perth Way, you've got Auckland Way and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to go back there. I took a cycle in there the other the other day and it's it's still the same as I remember it, which is mm-hmm. really nice. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the cycle when I, that I blew up my tyre, mind you, and I had to walk <laughs> two, two miles home, <laughs> which was always a good laugh. But it was, uh, no, it, it's nice seeing that happen to the city, yeah. And moving on, looking at the, the 2016 games in Rio, um, obviously, one of the, the best moments in your career, I can imagine. The, the guys can't see it, but behind you, you've got the framed uh, GB bib. I do indeed. Um, I do indeed. It's, like, it's, like a, it's, it's almost like a bed sheet, it's that big. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got so to I, experience Rio sort of different from what we know Rio to be. I mean, there's, there's obviously the Rio yeah. that Brazil want to show you. They want to show you Copacabana oh. Beach. They want to show you the the football and stuff like that, but there's things like the 100%. favelas um, and other bits of Brazil which are unknown to be a poverty stricken area. Well, that's, so what was that well, like for things. you? Um, genuinely, when you go to a major championships, um, so like a Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, or World Champs, um, the organisers show you the bits that are the nice bits. They don't mm. want to show you the slums and things like that. So we, I didn't see very much of Brazil before I competed, or Rio before I competed, because we're always taking the nice route into the stadium, the stadium and into the village, and it was always like the nice posh highways. And, but after, it, it kind of really hit home after I competed, because we had to do a security briefing after we um, after we competed to, to obviously ensure that we would be safe after. Because athletes, as athletes, will want to let their hair down. They'll go out for a couple of beers. They'll go out partying and things like that. So they wanted to ensure that we were safe. So I remember sitting down in a security briefing. And uh, it was an ex-copper from, mm. from MI6 that was there. And he said, right, okay. so he had a PowerPoint presentation. So he said, right, okay. And it was the, the things I took from it was like, don't go to Copacabana Beach. And I was like, ah, why? Everybody wants to go to Copacabana Beach. He says, well, because there was 400 sexual assaults in one weekend there. He says, that's men, women, and children. He said, here's a bit of maths for you. So 30% of crime is reported in Brazil. Do the maths and how many there was. And I'm sitting there going, oh, shit. No, not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. Am I going to cope like a man of each, right? I'm, I'm big, but no, you're all right. Avoid the favelas because you, there's a high chance you'll get shot. So there was two coppers drove into the favela by accident. I don't know how you drive into a favela by accident. You clearly know it's a favela. Mm-hmm. And the gang shot them, uh, shot them dead. Uh, and then there was a big gun battle across the highway in, in Brazil. And uh, the whole highway was shut. All flights in and out of Rio Airport that night were cancelled. So it was a, it was a massive kind of shock to the system. They said there's no such thing as a missing person inquiry in Brazil. It's just go straight to a homicide mm-hmm. because the chances are they won't they won't find you. Um, if you're on Copacabana Beach and you do go, there's probably a high chance you're going to get robbed. So have a couple of reals in your pockets. Give them that. They said because it's better to give them a couple of quid and they'll leave you alone because they won't take any problems in stabbing you. They said you might fight off the first one but you won't fight off the next 15 of them that come because there's, they all work in gangs. So it was a big kind of shock to the system for me. Um, so I, I felt like, I couldn't really go out uh, as such. Um, so, obviously, just went to go watch the other sports. Um, and then on the last night, um, there's always an after party as such. Now, mm-hmm. I, I'll kind of I'll go off tangent a wee bit here. Um, a lot of the houses have hospitality houses as such. So, you'll have, like, um, Team GB House. You'll have America House. You'll have um, Holland House. So, Holland House, for instance, was sponsored by Heineken. So, it was free beer at Holland House. Mm-hmm. So, if you've got a, um, an accreditation, you can get into Holland House and you can have a party on on Heineken for the night. So there's things, so they had specific places where you could go. So, but on the last night, there's always a party. So, um, uh, Team GB, uh, the BOA, sorry, um, which is British Olympic Association, decided that they would keep everybody in house. And they, you know, the big lazy spa hot tubs that everybody's mm-hmm. kind of ranting and raving about the now. So they go cold as well. So they turned on them cold, put ice in them and filled them with beer. And they're like, ah, yahoo, here we go. Just come back for the, for the closing ceremony, which was, which was pretty crap. I'm not going to lie to you because it was wet. We had light up trainers that were red, white, and blue that light up. I've still got them. <laughs> you, could char- you, could, you could charge them up. So they had a USB charger inside them and the soles that were rubber, kind of old like boat shoes, went mm-hmm. red, white, and blue. 
and I remember walking into my mates with them one day, turned all the lights off, walked over my red light, and like, <laughs> <laughs> then immediately banged them. So, uh, so we had all them, so we came back, and it, I said, oh, that's that, we're staying in the So we cleared, we cleared this, this hot tub, and we ended up playing beer pong, and uh, it was it's mental. I, I, I wish I could show you some of the videos. I've got photos of like the Brownlee brothers, absolutely sozzled, shall we say, to put it in a, 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 a final world. And it was one of the best things. So we cleared this hot tub, and then we think, right, that's enough. Right, we'll go to our bed now. So it's about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. Of course, they filled the hot tub again with beer, didn't they? So 5 o'clock in the morning by the time we finished it. And we, we'd all go to be our rooms by half past eight the next morning. Oh, it was the worst. It was literally the worst hangover I've had in my, ever had in my life. So it was horrific. <laughs> But, but going back to the village, the, the good point about the village is the, the, food, the food's really, really good. But there's also, when you go to um, Olympics, McDonald's is one of the sponsors of it. And it's mm-hmm. free McDonald's. Uh, so it was the best hangover cure I've ever had. But it was when, <laughs> uh, when, McDon- when McDonald's started opening up after lockdown, that is nothing compared to the queues <laughs> that are in the Olympic village, by the way. So, <laughs> so when I seen the queue at Easter House McDonald's, I was like, listen, that is nothing compared to the one at the village. <laughs> because most people, what they were doing was they were going to the, the, the McDonald's and ordering for the whole flat. So people, so when you when you go to the Olympics, it was staying in a big tower block, but everybody's in kind of individual flats. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's maybe six or seven athletes to a, to a flat. So they were going and just ordering for the full flat. And then take it back up. And there was a sign that said if you're ordering 30 items or more, you had to go to a different queue. And I was like, is that a challenge? Like, to order 30 <laughs> items in here? Like, that's the kind of way my mind was working. So, uh, aye, that was, it's, it's a surreal experience. And, you, and you've got everybody who's anybody walking, walking in on people. Like, you'll literally have um, every athlete stays here. The only, the only people who didn't stay there were the, the American basketball team who hired their own cruise ship. And, um, Parked it in the harbour at, at Rio Olympic, at Rio Olympics, at Rio Harbour. So they had their own cruise ship, and they had, every other athlete was there. Like Usain Bolt was there, Serena Williams, Djokovic, Andy Murray, people like that. If you're if you're competing at Olympics, you genuinely stay in the Olympic Village. So um, I was also quite fortunate enough to get sponsored by Nike um, just before that. Got a couple of pairs of shoes at them. I was like, dancing, I'm happy with that. But they signed you up for Nike Hospitality, which was a an 18 hole golf course. So they kitted you out for. To go play golf, you get literally left with two suitcases full of full of night kit, and uh, it, it was a, a strange experience because you had people like Carl Carl Lewis there. So Carl Lewis was was the last man before Usain Bolt to do the double <laughs> Olympics, but he also had Mark Henry, the, uh, the WWE wrestler there. So it was like two opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> it was just like. That's Mark Henry. <laughs> like, I was more starstruck. That's a more starstruck to see Mark Henry than I was Carl Lewis, which was strange. <laughs> but it's it's just like it's a weird, weird experience. Um, and like literally getting to getting to go to the, the closing ceremony, it was in the Maracan R. Um, and it's quite sad seeing that now because it's it's been uh, vandalised quite a bit after all the seats have been ripped out, and uh, and it's quite sad to the affairs. It's not had the the effect that I think the people of the, the Brazilian government thought it would have on Rio. Because you look at Glasgow, and there's a lot of Regeneration here, a lot of the, the venues still get used, whereas in Brazil, a lot of them lie empty now. So mm-hmm. I don't know what's I don't know what's happened with the village. I don't know what's happened with the venues, but a lot of them are empty now. So it's it's quite sad. No, it's certainly it's, as you say the experience of just being part of the Olympic family. We, we talk about the Celtic family, but the Olympic family: Serena Williams, Andy Murray, Djokovic, Usain Bolt, all the top class athletes. <laughs> And Chris Bennett, you forgot that one there. Oh, sorry, and Chris Bennett. <laughs> but, the former Olympian. <laughs> as you said, you, you class yourself as just a normal guy from the east end of Glasgow, so it, it must be so hard not to be starstruck just walking around that whole village and going, I've seen you on the telly, I've seen you on the telly, I support you. Oh, it, 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 was, it was a bit like that at, um, at Commonwealth Games because it was like the first kind of time that I'd seen people walking around the village and Bolt was in the village for a couple of days. He, he stayed at the Radisson Blue in, in Glasgow um, for most of the time, but he was in the village for a couple of days and it was just like, holy, that's your same goal. Like, that, that, that's what it, but then, when you get used to it and you've seen you've seen him a couple of times, like, it's not like, all right, there's your same ball. It's not, it's not <laughs> one of those ones. But it's, that's my pal. Uh, that's my pal. All right, you saying, it? what are you saying anyway? Uh, but it's, um, and you get used to it. It's such a, like, I remember, like, I, was, I spoke about how I, I worked at Great North Run and, Great Scottish run, and I met Mo Farah before I met him on a, on a team as such. So I was dropping mm-hmm. back at the airport one day, and uh, he, the tunes were on in my car. And I ended up taking a Snapchat on my on my phone, right? And it was a uh, it was Stormzy. So I put it on my Instagram, put it on Twitter. Of course, Stormzy gets wind of this and starts retweeting it and starts putting it on his Instagram. So I was getting all this abuse off 
Stormzy's fans saying, oh, there's Mo Farah's fat road man, there he is, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, so that's me. And I'm like, ah, oh, all right. So I'd kind of, I, I never thought I'd know, but and it was back in 2015, so it gets to 2016. I hadn't seen him since that moment, right? And we were both competing on the same morning. And generally what will happen is somebody will go to breakfast with you and make sure you're all right. So it'll generally be the physio. So it was my, it was my osteopath that was with me and it was the head of endurance that was my bow. And he's got his headphones on. <laughs> he's looking dead serious. And then he just turns and goes, takes his headphones off. All right, how's it? Like, obviously he didn't say it. And I just go, all right, big man, how's it going? Do you know what I mean? It was that sort of... <laughs> He did, like, it was just that much surreal. He completely flipped from being in that focus and it's like, ah, chatting away his, and then put his headphones on and went back into his own and I was just like, ah, that's quite cool. He still remembers me. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it's, 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 I don't get starstruck anymore. Um, and it, it, like, it's like when I used to see the players, I used to get starstruck, but now it's just like, oh, there's, it's not as a case of, oh, there's Scott Brown. It's like, it, because you've met not more famous people as such, you've met other people, you're like, oh, it just becomes normal as such. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, I, it's, it's a surreal seal world we live in, and, and the amount of money that gets gets thrown at the sponsorship of the Olympics is, Olympics is unreal. And for instance, Samsung give you a free phone for going, mm-hmm. um, Beats give you free headphones, Adidas give you all your kit. It's about three, four grand worth of kit. Um, so the amount of money that's involved in it, you don't get paid for going, but it's it's an amazing experience. And finally, the, the kind of last games that you've been to. Um, hopefully not your last games because you say you're still going still going I'm still going but I'm not former yet don't take me <laughs> off just yet it's the 2018 games in the Gold Coast now as you said yourself you kind of went over there and there was an expectation of you that you would have a chance of bringing home a medal we already spoke about that it didn't quite go the way that you anticipated it and there's various reasons for that but I've listened to a couple of the athletes that I actually went out to the Commonwealth Games I've, I've listened to Joe Hendry um, who was out competing at the wrestling and he's he's not quite sure that his preparation was right and he doesn't know whether that's down to him or whether it was down to the kind of acclimatisation uh, of going over there. What about yourself? Do, do you feel as if you're ready when you got there? I almost feel that I was too ready and it sounds really daft. I, so I was competing on the 4th of April. 4th of April? Yeah, 4th of April it would have been. No, it was the 8th. I'm lying here. I went at the village on the 4th and I, and I was competing on the 8th. Um, so I landed in Australia on the 14th of March. So mm-hmm. I flew over really, really, really early. I had two warm-up competitions before it. So I wanted to get there early and, and do something quite good. So I got there on the... I left Edinburgh on the Thursday and I landed in Brisbane on the Saturday, which I couldn't get my head around. I don't know how... I was like, how have I lost a day? Like, like, <laughs> well, well, I want that, I want that day back. Where is it? Where is it? It was, it was, it was, I couldn't get my head around it. So and then I was competing on the Tuesday, so it was quite a short turnaround, and, and I did all my time zone adapting before I'd left. So I stayed up the night before my flight, and actually st- I was flying from from Edinburgh via Doha, and then on to Perth and Brisbane. And I, I worked my flights; so I could sleep on the flights. Mm-hmm. So I got there on the Saturday. I had a little bit of jet lag on the Saturday night. Kind of fell asleep at nine o'clock. Woke up the next day and was was brilliant. Little session on the Sunday. Little session on the Monday. Went and competed the Tuesday and threw my second for the throw over. And I'm just like, okay, I'm in, I'm in good shape. Then like, I know I'm in good shape. Jet lag kind of hit for a week and then came back and I actually to slightly less than what I had the week done before. So I was only fifty centimeters down, but was in felt in better physical shape. So I was like, mm-hmm. I know I can can pick a big one of the day. And then I had two weeks till I competed. And it was in that two weeks where I kind of let my mind wander a wee bit. And I was like, you know what? Oh, my God. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the verge of doing something really, really good here. I'm on the verge of actually throwing really far. And it got to the day. And, I, and the first thing I thought about when I got to um, compete in Gold Coast was like, don't let it be Glasgow. Don't let it. Don't, let, let's not do a Glasgow, right? And looking back, it was the worst thing I could have ever done. I, I, I focus on what I'm doing on that day. And then and then only. It's like if I tell someone not to think of pink elephants. What are you going to do? You're going to think of pink elephant. So mm-hmm. I'm telling myself not to do what I did in Glasgow so I go back and do it. So it was it was tough for me in the day and it wasn't down to anything that anybody else done. It was purely purely me. Mm-hmm. It was purely me. And looking back on it, I, I probably flew in about four or five days before I compete. Now I couldn't have made that judgment at the time because I didn't know how I would react to that. But now knowing that I can have a quick turnaround after competitions in future, if, for instance, if I go to Japan for the Olympics, I'm probably not going to do a holding camp out there. I'm probably not going to um, go for two, three weeks beforehand. I'm going to fly in three, four days before and compete. And then that's that's me. I don't. I, I get on the time zone. I'm in every rhythm, and then I go. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's probably going to work quite well for me uh, in that sense. And it, and it was a, it was a trip of a lifetime though because um, my mum got to go out. Um, mm-hmm. The holding camp that we were staying at was amazing. It was it was a, it was, a, it was a Novotel hotel, but it was on the 
was a beach resort and we all had suites that we, that we lived in and um, so I was sharing the high jumper but he arrived a week, week after he said this sweet old myself big jacuzzi bubble bath it was it was incredible and um, I, it's, I, I'm looking back at it it was, it was kind of your typical kind of Australia, you would open the doors and there'd be kangaroos outside, and that's what they called me, but there literally was kangaroos, there was literally kangaroos outside, and they told me I'd never see a snake and a spider when I was there, I seen five snakes, and we drove over one in the first night, and I just about shit myself, because I don't do, I don't do snakes and spiders, <laughs> I don't do snakes and spiders, uh, and, um, but we couldn't, we drove, we actually drove over the snake, and they say that if it's there on the way back, that's a good sign, because you've obviously killed it and it's no moving. Mm-hmm. It wasn't there on the way back, so we thought, oh my God, it's in the wheels, it's inside the car. So I didn't want to get in that, inside that car for three, four days. <laughs> but no, it was, um, it was an amazing experience. Like I said, my mum got to go, we got to do the whole um, Australia Zoo. That was one thing she wanted to do. She wanted to go to Australia Zoo and see the, the crocodile hunters, because that's where like, Steve, Steve Irwin had his zoo and things like that. So mm-hmm. it, was, it, was whole, it was an amazing experience. And, and, I'd love to go back and just see it as a, a tourist because one of the one of the, the downsides of being an athlete is we don't actually get to spend much time in and around the, the cities and, and the places that we go to visit. We're there to compete and then we probably fly home or we've got a wee bit of time after it. We don't have much time. So I'd love to go back to Australia and, and see what it was like. But it was it's just an amazing place and um, probably up there in my favourite place along with South Africa that I've been to just on, on training camps. It's been amazing. I mean, it certainly sounds like an absolutely fantastic career, but as you say, it's it's not over yet. And I remember you. I've heard you say before that twelfth in twenty fourteen, tenth twenty eighteen, <laughs> Birmingham is scheduled for twenty twenty two. We're going to get an eighth in there. Eight. I'm going to be, I'm going to be eight. I'm going to be playing. I'm going to be playing lawn bowls by the time I'm uh, I'm six. I'm going to be the Willie Woods of the club. At least with these uh, bowlers, it's been about eight or nine Commonwealth games. So I laughed and joked that I'm going to have to change sports every single time. <laughs> and keep going. It's like. I'm just like, do you know what? If I get, I'll get it to Birmingham, and I'll, 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 it's just the joy of being there. I go, I go in there, and, and whatever happens on the day happens. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to put pressure on myself and say I'm going to win a medal. I'm going to do that because I'm, go- I'm just going to do things completely different. I'm going to treat it as a normal competition. I'm going to stay at home right until the day before the competition. I can do that because it's in Birmingham, and, and literally just either fly down or drive down and stay in a hotel the night before, and then go compete. Not going to the village, and and if I do well off the back of that, I do, I do well. You know, it's a it's a busy year for us in, in, in twenty twenty two. Um it's really busy because they've they've moved the, the world champs back to a year because obviously the Olympics is going. Mm-hmm. And we've got we've got the European champs that year as well. So it's um we've got three major championships in the back in the space of th- six weeks. So it's like we've got to be I think we go in Oregon, uh, which is the world champs and in, in uh it'll be track town, which is in, in Oregon, but that's obviously the whole night headquarters. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'll be that'll be That'll be incredible to be at. And then two weeks later, we've got Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. And then two weeks after that, we've got the European Champs in, in Munich. Uh, so it's a, it's a busy, busy year. But it's like, as an athlete, that's the moment you live for. You just you just want them to come thick and fast and, and, and get all those experiences in. Um, so yeah, for, for, it's a big year. I've got my life kind of planned up to that. And then what I do after that, I don't really know. Um, probably, I'll probably stick around and try and do another Olympics, try and do a, a third Olympics because... The way I look at it is, is, it's like next year's Olympics is 2021, and then it'll be only be three years to another Olympics. So it's, I think it's a lot easier to get my head around and say, like, you've got to do another three years as opposed to another four years. Mm-hmm. Um, so, no, it'll be, it's, it's good. It's exciting times as well. And I think a lot of people are just wanting sport back. Yeah. And, and wanting it with, with, with fans and with crowds and, and things like that. And I don't, I don't see how they could have ever had the Olympics this year. Um, it's, it should have been in what, uh, three weeks' time? Mm-hmm. Three weeks time, and it's madness to think that they were still thinking two months ago that they could have had Olympics. So, um, yeah, hopefully the world's a different place this time next year. Hopefully we've got 10 in a row, and hopefully um, I'll be at uh, Tokyo for the Olympics. I think that's just a perfect way to wrap everything up for your career. I mean, as you say, you've went through so much. You've, you've had so many ups, so many downs, um, and the fact that you're still battling and competing at such a high level despite all the the kind of mental health struggles that you've had is just a testament to, to your character. And on behalf of the podcast, we wish you all the best for the, the rest of your career. Um, but so we're, not, we're not going to let you off lightly. We did say that we were going to leave you with a question, and it was your favourite Celtic moment of last season. So you thought it was going to be Rome, but it's not going to be Rome. It's <laughs> going to be League Cup final. Because we were getting absolutely battered for that 90 minutes. Uh, I remember the first half, we had El Yunusi on. We had Lewis Morgan up front. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Paisley Messi 
as he was up front that playing that false nine sort of role and because but he played against Ren Ren just before it and he was brilliant against Ren and then uh, I think we were in there and the Rangers centre half just dom- dominated them. I think it was it was Katic and um, Goldson that finished the game because I think Holanda were off that game. Mm-hmm. And we were getting absolutely battered for 45 minutes. And Fraser Foster kept us in the game. They absolutely get. And uh, can I just say, I think this has probably been. I seen a tweet the other day about someone saying, Is there ever players who have played for a club and come back and their second spell has been better than their first? Can I just say, probably Fraser Foster this year has been better than he's ever been? Well, it's quite interesting you say that because this season was his fourth spell. So I don't think there's ever been a player that's come back for his fourth spell that's been better than the previous three. (laughs) Oh, there you go. Well, (laughs) there you go. Technically, it is his fourth spell. So I think like he has been the difference this year. Uh, Just that solidity at the back of, and that's that's been the difference under uh, kind of um, Neil as opposed to Brendan Rodgers. It's not this tippy tappy out for the back and. Mm-hmm. Trying to play that sort of football with Craig Gordon. Craig Gordon, brilliant goalkeeper with an absolute brilliant shot stopper, but with the ball at the feet, he was no great. It's like it's like Boyata as well. Trying to play that football with Boyata, absolute specimen of a of a human being, but a bomb scare with the ball with the ball mm-hmm. at his feet. Absolute like run and hide behind your your, your hands when he's got the ball at his feet. So bringing him back in was was a kind of stroke of genius. But then just get absolutely battered for forty five minutes, and then you get to that. That 55, 60 minute mark, bringing Eddie on, he wins a free kick. Big Superman, Julian winning the, scoring the goal and coming down. And I just remember going, surely we cannot steal this. Yeah. I was like, this is going to be the day that they finally beat us in a, in a final and win a trophy. So then going for that elation of Eddie coming on and changing the game to be Frimpong getting sent off and, and pulling down Morelos. And you just think, surely he's going to score. Surely he can't miss it. And, it was hopeless. It was like, <laughs> it was terrible. So it just it made it all the sweeter that it was against Rangers, and it made it even sweeter again the fact that we were getting absolutely battered for ninety minutes, and it was just it was a testament to that team because they find a way to win even when they're not playing well, mm. they still find a way to win. And um, it was a, it was a tough sort of time because there was a lot of injuries there. So um, El Yusuf wasn't fit, Edward wasn't fit, uh, El Hamid wasn't fit. Who you would probably say is probably the first choice right, choice right back. Mm. Um, so it was made it was made all the sweeter by that. And I was I was up in the top tier, and it was just oh so what a, what a day, what an absolute day. And uh, to see all the uh, the tweets from the Rangers fans right after it saying we were robbed, we were robbed, we were robbed. It just made it great. It was it was great and I, and I would take a pint of those tears any day. <laughs> I think there'd be, a, there'd be a queue at the bar for that, definitely. <laughs> and I, when, the beer gar- when, the beer, when the beer gardens open up, I hope they've got them on tap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of pubs about the East End that are definitely thinking about that. <laughs> and I have to say, I have to say, if Lewis Morgan is listening, Chris apologises for calling you the Paisley Messi. We know you're a good Gurup boy. And we don't like the pace of people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but Chris, thanks for joining us today. Um, where can we find you on social media? You can find me at Instagram and Twitter. So at Bennett Hammer 89 on Instagram, at Chris Bennett 89 on Twitter. And I'm no giving you my Facebook because that's my private stuff and you'll only get photos of my dog. <laughs> 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 and you don't want you don't want photos of my dog. My dog is just basically me, but in dog form. He's, he's a fifty kilo staffy American bully, so uh, he's a big old boy. So I've had to lock him lock him out the room so he doesn't start licking me to death during this recording. <laughs> Chris, once again, thanks for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind. All the best for when the season gets back up and running, uh, and I hope to bump into you at Celtic Park sometime. Cheers, Colin. 